Hello, dental online trainers, and welcome to the Dental Online Training Sharecast. I'm your host, Dr. Dennis Hartley. Each month, we'll talk with dental experts who are doing amazing work in the world of dentistry. Also, occasionally, I'm going to throw in a few of my solo bonding sharecasts where I share a little with you about what I've learned along the way during my career. So tune in the first Tuesday of every month to hear the latest episodes. Hello, dental online trainers. Dr. Dennis Hartley back with you with another episode of our wonderful dental online training sharecast. And today I have a very special guest. It's sort of a new friend. You know, you think back, you know, I, I think back about my old friends. And, uh, you know, there's, it's funny, there's an old article, there was a guy named Mitch Elbum who used to write sports for the uh, Detroit Free Press when I was a kid. And he talked about the difference for, for guys with old friends and, and new friends. Mm-hmm. And like old friends, when you're like, when I'm a kid, you could like, you know, you could hit someone on the side of the head when you're a kid, you know, imagine me like meeting a new guy today, I'm 60 years old, and I walk up to the guy and we become friends, I whack him on the side of the head, or I pull down his shorts or something that you would do as a kid, right? Yeah. And a rustle around on the ground. And, and Mitch talked about how for guys, we would develop an intimacy with our childhood friends that we're not able to recreate as adults so easily Mm -hmm. because we could be more physical with them as teenagers or younger than that, even that we, that we can't do that as adults very well in our, in our world today. Having said that, I think I have some wonderful adult friends that I've gotten to know and gotten really close with, but that that always, that always makes me think about my younger days, nonetheless. Today, I'm excited to uh, have a little conversation with uh, my new friend, Melissa Siebert. Did I say that right? Seibert or Siebert? Quite all right, Seibert, but two Seibert. different so, my, Everyone gets it. Everyone says Siebert. All right. So if you don't know Melissa, uh, she's someone that you're going to be seeing a lot. She's, first of all, she has the best damn podcast um, out yes. there. Thanks. She really does, man. If, you, if you're if you a dental geek and you want to learn about dentistry and you want to learn the science behind dentistry, so nothing that I'm going to talk about on here, but if you want to learn the science, then you got to dig into Melissa's podcast because it is the best. And if you want to geek out and learn about materials, if you want to learn about technique, she has the best guests and she has just really just awesome, awesome content. So check out her, uh, what, what do you call that again? Dental Digest. Dental Digest. So check that out on your podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, Melissa was recently awarded um, by the Incisal Lead Magazine, 40 Under 40, meaning she's like under 40, of course, and she's one of 40 people that you need to be looking out for. So you're looking out for her right now. Thanks. Now, one of the other things I want to talk about is she has this, uh, this mastermind group that she started through Instagram, and I am very fortunate to be part of this mastermind group. And Melissa, in her ever-going ever geekness, um, decided that she wants just to hang out with dentists and talk about dentistry. And every month we meet and we just re someone will give a presentation and we'll just talk dentistry on a Tuesday mm. evening each month. Mm. So that's a little bit of background on, on Melissa, but what you also need to know, she's in the air force and she's a practicing dentist in the air force graduate of the university of Louisville dental school. If I remember correctly. And uh, she's just a really engaged and awesome young dentist that is really, really working hard to do really high quality dentistry and connect with others that are trying to do the same. So Melissa, welcome to our ShareCast. Oh, that was the kindest intro. Thank you so much. You know, it is funny. I think I I do really enjoy your friendship. I think we're wired very similarly. And it's funny though, because I feel like whenever we hang out, it's like, yeah. So, you know, you talked about how I, so I, I would disagree with you where you said kind of, oh, these friendships that we build um, and our youth are not quite the same in adulthood, but I would almost say kind of what we're up against as adults is much more sophisticated. And I feel like we form um, much more beautiful friendships because we can talk about really in-depth things. I mean, I think even before we went live, like the first 20 minutes, my gosh, we were talking about like managing difficult patients. I mean, the trials and tribulations, but Yeah, I'm very grateful for our friendship. I feel like uh, us Midwesterners have to stick together. Right. That's exactly it. We're the good people in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so Melissa, where'd you grow up? Well, you're all over. You're you're an Army brat or your first brat or an Army brat? Navy. 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 Good memory. Exactly. I um, moved every two to three years. 
uh, which was really tricky. So moved every two, three years. We even moved my senior year. But it's funny. I've been thinking a lot about this. I think I had a lot of resentment about that. I was so jealous of, you know, my husband, for example, who lived in the same household his entire life. But it's weird because now I see how just about every setback I've ever faced um, or any sort of hardship has made me who I am and has opened up so many doors. So I don't know if I necessarily regret it, but so in so many words, I've lived in literally every region of the country. Your your dad's a physician, was a physician in the Navy, correct? Oh, submariner. So submariner in the Navy. So a little, yeah, a bit different, um, but he and I can definitely still relate on a lot of matters. There's probably, I probably reach out to him every two weeks for advice. Wow. Did you spend any time on a submarine? We uh, actually did. In fact, especially prior to 9-11, um, it was so easy to go on. Um, submarines actually have these massive nuclear weapons on them. Um, so these days, my gosh, like sure. hardly anybody can get on. But growing up, we would like, they would do these cool things where the submarine would be docked. And so we'd go have like Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner on the submarine, go tour it. Like it was just very exciting as a kid. How long would your dad be gone for when when he was on a on a deployment? How long would he be gone for? Um, so probably anywhere from every four to six months, uh, which gives me hope um, because you know one day I would like to have kids. Um, but I am a little bit of a workaholic. I'm quite the workaholic. You and I were talking about this, and it gives me hope because you know my dad was gone like half my life on deployments. But I mean, to this day, like whenever. He's probably the first, if not the second person I'll call whenever there's a big win in my life or I need advice. We're going through buying uh, another home where we're about to move to, which is always unsettling. Um, So I'm always reaching out to him about it. So the long answer is you don't always have to be there all the time to be a really impactful parent. And I, I think I think that's good for people to know, because I know a lot of people listening right now might feel guilty about how much time they're spending in the office. Yeah, I think that uh, anyone who's uh, practicing full time, and especially if you have your own practice, or even as an associate, if you're trying to move forward, there's so much more. I mean, let's say that, let's say you don't even own your own practice, let's say that you're an associate in a practice, but if you are into continuing education, if you're in study clubs, if you're doing all that other stuff, there's lots of things that take you away. And that's a real, that's a real struggle for a lot of younger dentists and a lot of, um, you know, parents, both male and female, I think it's, uh, it's equally stressful on how to manage the family and how to be there. And uh, right. I, I think you can relate to that. Right. Did you know that you were going to be like in, in the service? Was that something that was sort of preordained as growing up that like, Hey, this is, this is a, like a cool path along the way? Yeah. By the way, one thing I should probably just throw this out there. I like to say this for anything that I do. um, And I'm sure this is common sense, but just protecting myself, you know, whatever I'm talking about, it's not intended to be reflective or endorsed by the Air Force or Department of Defense. Just saying. So did I know? Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, Did I know I was going to be in? So great question. Um, My parents went to the Naval Academy for undergrad. And so both your parents. Yeah. My mom was actually the fourth class woman ever to graduate. And um, it's wild because growing up, we would like go to these Navy football games, like oftentimes perhaps it'd be like the Navy, Army, Navy game. And at every service academy, they always do this wild thing where they have like the midshipmen or the cadets march on. Um, And it is, have you ever seen it? No. So, well, yes. And that's my bucket list. That's one of my bucket list items is going to the Army, Navy game. Yeah, for sure. No, what you need to do is, um, so last year, because my dad went to Air Force my dad was Navy, but I went to Air Force. So we went to the Air Force Navy game and I'll have to tell you about that in a second. It was wild. I I like wound up on ESPN, um, definitely like uh, getting rowdy. But um, this year we're going to Air Force Navy and it's going to be in Annapolis and I'm going to be living in Virginia. So, oh my gosh, please come down. Like it will be lit. (laughs) Oh, how fun. Yeah, no, that's, that is the Hallmark game, the Army Navy game. It's the week after all the other football games. And so Mm -hmm. the big game for me is the Michigan Ohio State game. All the DOT listeners out there know I'm a big Michigan guy. So that's my big game. And then the week after is what I look forward to is watching the Army Navy Army game and watching the midshipmen and the cadets walk in. And yeah. it's just, it's such a, such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. But so basically growing up, um, it's just really I like awe-inspiring. Um, and they would do just these like incredible flyovers and just how it's 
a college experience unlike any other. And so I really wanted to go to the Naval Academy, but I'm a little high maintenance. I like a little, I'm, I'm high maintenance for on the low maintenance spectrum. Maybe I'll say that. And so my dad was like, Hey, you would fit into the air force a lot more, um, which is really terrible. I don't think. How's it different with the Navy and the air force? Why? Honestly, I think the air force is a bit more progressive. I do. Oh. So yeah, so basically, so I went to the Air Force Academy, right? And so like for our summer, um, where it's like, you know, it's like they call plebe summer uh, at Navy for us, it's like base cadet summer, it's boot camp on steroids. And at Navy for my cohorts, like the other women entering that year, if you couldn't get your hair up into a bun, I think within 60 seconds, you get your hair chopped. Wow. <laughs> but for, for Air Force, they didn't have that time limit. It was just like, yeah. oh, can you reasonably demonstrate it? And I mean, just a number of things like that. I, I feel like they, they do try to be a lot more progressive. And so, but yeah, basically the long way of saying this is so I went to the Air Force Academy for undergrad. And so the only way I could have gone to dental school is through the Air Force. They only let three of us go. So I snagged one of those spots. Um, and then from that, it was like, you know, so there I kind of owed a commitment for doing the HPSP scholarship. And then I did three years of like an AGD. So mm -hmm. I owe more time for that. So I, uh, we're definitely racking up debt with you. <laughs> With the Air Force. Now tell me something. So how is it that you ended up in dentistry in the first place? Because neither of your parents are, are dentists, correct? Yeah. So how did how'd you end up in dentistry? Great question. I don't know. When I was in kindergarten, this dentist came and talked to us. Like, did you ever have that in elementary school? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally, totally random. Um, but that I was like, this lady, this is what's up. Like, this is what I am gonna do with my life. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, and it's weird because I went through a crisis in dental school and I'd like to hear if you've had one of those moments where I was like, I don't know if this is for me. I don't think I, I like this. Did you ever have one of those? Uh, you know, that's a great question. And like you, I was very young when I decided that I wanted to be a dentist and doing the share cast, what I found fascinating is how many just wonderfully skilled dentists, like didn't know what they were going to do. They were in they were in college. They're like, well, I got to do something. And they ended up going into dentistry and, you know, yeah. they've been just incredible dentists, but I was young and uh, I liked my dentist and I went into dentistry. I struggled uh, from the academics of dentistry. And so I don't know if I ever thought that it wasn't for me. I just wondered if I wasn't good enough for it. And so mm -hmm. that was, that was sort of where I came from. But I I have I fell in love with dentistry and I've just been so blessed that the dentistry that I graduated with is not the kind of dentistry we get to do today. And I think we're so blessed with the dentistry we have in front of us um, from just the composites that we have available, the ceramics that are available, the the digital stuff, just our understanding and the understanding of our science. Our science is so much stronger. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I think maybe it was more just reversed. I don't think I was worried that it wasn't for me. I didn't know if I was it. I was good enough for it, to be honest. Mm. That's where I came from. Well, we definitely have to delve into that in a second because I think it's just, it's so but funny. That's on your podcast. You can have your own podcast. No, no, it. no. Well, it's just so <laughs> funny because you have to, like you, Dennis, probably have to, you had to have had this moment and just kind of laughed a little bit at your younger self when perhaps you were having these moments. And actually we, we have to talk about this because I had like a very similar experience to what you're describing, but you had to have sat back and laughed and been like, wow, I, I have made it in 20, 30 years ago. I didn't know I'd be at this point. So kudos to you, but yeah, um, I don't ever feel like I made it. I think every patient, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that I, heard early on, it was from a periodontist I worked with, uh, Alan Rosefeld. He said, Dennis, you can spend your whole entire career building your, your legacy and you can spoil your legacy with one patient. So yes. it's, you're, you're always creating your legacy. Every patient, every procedure, you're creating your legacy. Mm -hmm. So I've never felt like, Hey, you know, I can put my flag on the, on the, on the mountaintop. I think it's still, you know, still climbing and still trying to get better at my craft and, and well, that gets back to you because for one of the challenges, I think in, for young dentists is just the overwhelming amount of material there is out there to learn. Mm. When I was in dental school, it was easy. We had to learn about amalgam and gold and PFMs essentially. Yeah, so we had to know a lot about a little bit, 
But nowadays for dental students and for young dentists, there's so much information and the information seems to be changing just, you know, every couple of years, there's new, newer materials and newer procedures. How, so, well, I want to go back first. So you, you, you want to be a little, you, as a little kid, you want to be a dentist and you ended up going to Louisville for, for your dental school. Where'd you go for undergrad? Mm, Air Force Academy. Oh, that's right. You did your Air Force Academy mm-hmm. and then you did, uh, uh, God, I have so many questions about the Air Force Academy because I've never, oh, I, I have no oh experience. All right, let's talk about the Air Force about Academy it. and then we'll come back to that. So what is it, how many women were in your class at the Air Force Academy? Okay, so I think it was uh, 20%. Uh, so there's oh. a thousand. So I think about 200. Okay, so so more than what I would have assumed. What year did you start at the Air Force Academy? 2010. And also as an aside, um, I am like a glutton for punishment. And so basically they took eight of us each semester and we could either do a semester exchange at West Point or Navy. And I was like, I'm going to make my dad really mad and do a semester exchange at West Point. So that was, that was a formative experience too. Wow. So what was the women to male to female uh, ratio at West Point? I think it was way less. I think it was like 12%. I mean, I'm shooting from the hip a little bit, but something like 12%. Uh, you know, you read things, you hear things um, about yeah. the challenges of women in a very male centric environment, much like what dental school was back in the day. Now dental schools are 50, 50, or, you know, maybe more female than male, but there must've been challenges being a, being a female in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, also I do have to say how it's funny how whenever you give me a question, I then like launch off into this tangent. I feel like I'm being quite the politician where it's like, oh, let me answer your question by talking about what I want to talk about. But um, (laughs) it's maybe it's always more entertaining that way. But okay, so yes, there were challenges. But it really, I really have this belief of this whole idea of he for she, where women or minorities or any group that's perhaps not in the majority, they rise because people in the majority advocate for them and they mentor. And I think, you know, in dentistry, I think there is a little bit of an issue where it's like, you know, like, yeah, there are a good bit of women in dentistry, but who's really at the top? But I see the way male leaders who um, are very well respected really are kind of like taking a stand to elevate women in dentistry. And you're certainly one of them. You know, like, yeah, at service academies, we certainly had some of those issues, but I'm eternally grateful, I think, to perhaps the men in leadership positions that I saw that took a stand um, and created a certain culture. So, yeah, I mean, gosh, we could go on quite a diatribe about that. Well, you know, and I bring that up and it's interesting. I've never heard the the he for she, and I'm assuming that means that men who are, are um, petitioning that women have equal rights, equal voice. That they're they're saying, hey, we we need to have more women in in leadership, or just they're they should they're not subservient. They should be looked at as equals. Is that what he for she means? I think it's just this idea of people that are in positions of authority stewarding their authority in such a way that it uplifts part of their legacy is that they want to make a better place for others, even if those others are not exactly like them. And I think it's, it's really, it, I think I feel so strongly that it starts way earlier than that. I think it starts with mentorship. I mean, I'm just so grateful. So for example, like I, I I feel like decades ago, the model was typically someone like you um, who was experience in their career would mentor a young male perhaps my age but you see this paradigm shifting where um you know we're at a meeting in chicago and um a couple weeks ago and you could see though all these very influential male dentists who rather than bringing like a young male dentist to the meeting they extended their invitation to a young female uh to lift them up and i just thought that was so beautiful and I think that's actually, it's creating change is simpler than perhaps we think it is. And it starts with just extending mentorship. Well, I think that's well said. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was going to venture into dentistry, Mm -hmm. uh, growing up in the eighties in dentistry. So I graduated in 88 and funny enough, I was just looking at my class photo just last weekend, quite honestly, I was looking for some other photos. I came across my class photo and I counted, we had 40% women in our class. Wow. which which was quite unusual for the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I when I talked to people and they were talking about how male centric their schools were, we we had 
more male teachers for sure, but we had plenty of female teachers as well. And we had a heavy, heavy pre presentation of women uh, students. But I know that it's still a challenge in some schools today in some settings. And as you referenced, uh, we were talking about the, uh, the Academy of Restorative Dentistry meeting, which is sort of like the old boys club. Uh, there's Betsy Bakeman's going to be the first female president coming up in 2025. This organization has been around nearly 100 years, and she's the uh, first female pres president, which is not right. How, how has this happened? But 20 years ago, you would look around the auditorium for the mm -hmm. lecture, and it'd be 90% men, 10% female. Nowadays, you look, and I bet it's probably closer to 60-40, simply yeah. because we still have so many male members, but we have so many female invitees. So maybe it's not quite 60-40, but it's certainly getting closer. Being in a male-centric environment in the Air Force, did that help you, do you think, when you went to dental school in a, in a traditionally male-centric environment, the, the dental school education? Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's necessarily a relationship there, because uh, I, I think my dental school was pretty, like... 50 50. In fact, I think, I think actually the transition for me, because at that point I was then became a civilian for four years. And that was actually really hard for me. Like I actually really struggled with that. Um, but in terms of that, did it like necessarily give me a leg up for dental school? I don't, I don't think so, but you know, it's interesting because you talked about how like, Hey, um, I like, I feel like you're an exceptional educator and I feel like you know, you kind of talked about how, hey, maybe dental school, I didn't like nail it. I was in the class position, um, perhaps that I could have been, but yet interestingly, now you're really a premier leader in dentistry. Um, and it's interesting because dental school, I really face some struggles. Like basically I, so I think I've shared this with you. I have sleep apnea. I sleep with a CPAP every night and my um, AHI, I think in REM sleep was like 48, right? And so I feel like I had, I think, I mean, I pretty much have had sleep apnea in my entire life, right? And I feel like as a kid, I was able to power through enough. And even through undergrad, I was able to survive. But I think dental school was academically demanding enough that that was where I met my match. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think with the sleep apnea, oh my gosh. And it wasn't at, treated at that point. In fact, I didn't sure. get diagnosed with it until the end of the very end of dental school. And it changed my life. But it's it's interesting because I don't know, like I can really kind of, like I'm going into a teaching position and I, I don't know, like, I think I can kind of sympathize very much with like the academic struggle. Didn't, didn't you hear that uh, sleep apnea is a male disease? Have you, have you not, did you not see that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I didn't like <laughs> did uh, read that? the textbook. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Uh, I also have sleep apnea. My HI is 37. So I sleep with a dental appliance uh, and I have for over a decade. Yeah. And thanks to Jim Metz and Jeff Rouse for waking me up to that. Otherwise, I'd probably be like my parents. Both my parents were dead by my age. So, oh. uh, and both had sleep apnea for sure, undiagnosed at the, at the time. We were so unaware of that. Yeah. When you said that those four years when you're in dental school and you're out of the military, mm -hmm. a little fish out of water? Or was it, I, I don't know. Is, is there something yeah. about being in the military in the day-to-day -day environment that was different when you got to dental school? Is it was just that you all of a sudden you're like, man, I'm around a bunch of really smart people. And these people are just like, they're, they're killing it. And I'm having a hard time keeping up, which was my issue at Michigan. What was, what, what was the deal? I think honestly, um, one of the really beautiful things about the military is that you always belong. You mm -hmm. always belong somewhere. And I do think that you know, some people don't always like this, but kind of the beautiful thing is for better, for worse, you're always very much so accountable to someone. Um, there's kind of, and in a good way. So for example, if like, I think like my boss, for example, probably takes on a position that'd be very different from a different, like another boss. So, um, if I seem like I'm down, he can really tell, and he'll kind of inquire further, like that day, you know, whereas maybe perhaps if I was working somewhere else, I, I don't know. They they kind of wouldn't give it a second thought and they would just be like, well, are, are they productive? You know, like if you are late to work, like someone knows and it, it's kind of a beautiful thing, right? Like someone always has your back and you belong and it's kind of neat because you really, I don't know, there's something kind of beautiful about being a part of something much bigger than yourself. For sure. And I think it was just very hard for me because I was away from home. Like I didn't have any family in Kentucky at the time. Um, and this was really like the first time I was kind of truly on my own. And 
it was really lonely to be like, man, I could just not show up to class for a week and no, no one's don't. actually going to call. I'm just going to get a call if like my grades are dropping. That like, that did something to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I was just uh, down at Fort Hood and I got to present to the Army AEGD down yeah. at Fort Hood this past weekend. And I got to hang out. They have like 16 residents. And I tell you, it was such a family environment. Uh, I really was just touched by how just being in the same room and the interaction with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know every every year it changes, right? You have different personalities that come in and stuff and there's right. gonna be all that. But this particular couple of years of AEGD, man, they were awesome. And I just, yeah. I was just soaking in the vibe of them just being around each other. And that was really cool. And so I don't know if that's how, I, I'd assume there's some of that with all military installation type things because you're sort of all in it together. Mm -hmm. Um but it, it, it reminded me of my dental school experience because we had a really close dental school class. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll tell you a story. So when I was freshman, first D1, first year of dental school, I was studying for gross anatomy. Mm -hmm. And I was in Michigan Library. The Michigan Library is like out of Oxford. It's this huge, it looks like it's out of Harry Potter. It's got all this stained glass. It's just very cathedral-like. And I'm in the very back, facing the back wall. And it's midnight and I'm drawing the lines, the, the arteries of the hand. And cause I'm, cause I'm so behind and trying to learn. And I hear people start laughing and no one laughs at the Michigan law school library. Yeah. And I don't even look, I just start closing my books and I'm assuming it's going to be about me. And sure enough, four of my classmates come in nylons over their heads, black hoodies on. And they literally pick me up out of my chair they grab my backpack and they say, this is the last time you're studying on a Saturday night in dental school. And they Aww. literally carried me out and they threw me in the back of a Jeep and they drove me to a party. Aww. Right. And so when I was with this group, I felt that, but I can see that every class is different. Every school is different, but I can, um, I can, I can feel what you were saying that you had and what you were missing because not all dental school environments are like that. And teaching at Marquette, we can certainly see class by class. Some classes are close, some classes are not. And uh, I was just fortunate to be be around people who cared and loved me and and supported me and got me out of a very non you know non healthy sort of a toxic um, uh, study mode that I was in. So so there's that. So yeah. little background. Uh, I have a question for you. So when you were doing your um, AEGD after mm -hmm. you got out, so that's a three year program, correct? Yeah, it's it's weird. So I basically did one year of an AEGD. Um, and then I went and practiced for two years. And then I, cause you, you have the option, right? You can do either, um, you basically have three options, right? You can do a single one-year AGD, or you can do a two-year AGD, or you can do the one year and then do a two-year, which is like legit. I mean, yeah. you get incredible training. Um, so yeah, I did a one-year practice for two years. Then I did the two-year AGD and I'm about to graduate and I'm ready to graduate. <laughs> so where did you go practice for two years? Goodfellow Air Force Base um, in San Angelo, Texas, which that was a really good experience too, actually. It was very small town, Texas, but you're it, right? Like there are no really other specialists there. So you get a you get to do a lot. Like I got to do a lot of complex third molar exodontia, like a lot of IV sedations, a lot of molar endo, yikes, like ortho. I mean, it was it was a dream for a young dentist. So I, I was unfamiliar with this, and I heard this also when I was down at uh, Fort Hood. So that's not uncommon that you might do a year, or you may actually do private practice, or not private practice, but you may be practice. doing patient treatment in the service, mm -hmm. and then go and do your AEGD afterwards, which is a lot of what these these uh, these young women and men were doing at the at the army. And so that's sort of what you did. Yeah, and it's it's good. Like it kind of it actually is good, I think, because. Um, I don't know. Sometimes a person can spend their whole life in academia and learn and learn and learn. But it really, the real learning, I think, happens when you're given enough rope to go out and make some mistakes. And that's where you really learn. Um, and then I think it kind of strengthens your resolve that like you're ready for this because mm -hmm. you know how it's like if you just jump into three years of this after dental school, right? I'd be so burnt out. I couldn't care about anything. That's why I didn't go to Prosso. I was so burned out from, from undergrad and dental school. I just was just, I was just oh, tired. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. What what advice do you get for give for someone who's looking and this could be someone who's going to be going in dental school or someone who's in dental school thinking about the service? What what advice would you give? Shoot. Yeah, what okay, what advice would I give? 
Okay, so all right, here I'm gonna tell you what immediately comes to my mind. I think that people, this is just me, right? This is I really have to emphasize enough. This is not like anything reflective by the Air Force, right? right. This is just my feelings. I think oftentimes people want to go in because either they want to travel or for the student loan repayment. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's nice. But I think, um, so there's always a possibility that you might not get a base that you want to go to. That's a possibility, right? And in terms of loan repayment, the militaries, they're not the only ones that do loan repayment. But I will tell you what's exceptional and what's really worth considering is the education you're going to get. It is truly second to none. I feel like, yeah, um, when you get out of dental school, you definitely have the option to go and like ball out and go to all these incredible expensive courses. And like, you better believe I'm on wait list for some of them because I'm all, I'm all for it. Right. I'm I'm all for what you're doing at DOT. Like I've learned so much from you, but the training you get is exceptional. Like the skills that I have and the experiences that I have, um, And the didactic education you get like sets you up for life. And for me, that's what I really value. So I would just, I guess I would just really ask yourself, why are you going to do it? Because if it's to travel, that's not always guaranteed Um, for loan repayment. I I don't think that's a good enough reason to do it. But if you like really want to perhaps have the opportunity to be exceptional, like not saying I'm exceptional, but having that opportunity to get that training. And that's what it sounds like when I was talking to the AGD fellows uh, and women, they said that their the amount of didactic um, coursework is incredible. And the amount that they've learned has really been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, were you surprised by that? Was that something that you were expecting? Or is that something that like you're going, you're on this journey, you're going to go into the Air Force, you're, you're do this age, AGD, do you just like, like, oh, I'm here. And then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, this is really just like way more than what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So, and maybe this is why I brought up the situation with sleep apnea. It's like, I struggled in dental school, right? Like, I don't know. I mean, sleep is so essential. And I think that was where I kind of met my match. So then it was like, so I started sleeping with the CPAP and then I don't know. I feel like I realized I was putting my life on hard mode, but there, I think academically, I was definitely behind the power curve before I came into the air force. Um, and I think I'm just eternally grateful because I think they really got me caught up to speed you know? Um, so no, I, I think it, I wasn't expecting it and it was kind of like my saving grace. <laughs> um, for those who might be watching this, uh, my cat chip has just joined us and he needs some attention. So if I, if I should holler, it's because he likes to scratch and bite a little bit. So I'm oh, that's trying, so to, funny. trying to keep him comfortable. Sometimes I let my dogs come in with me. They're not, they're not here. Like I'll do it on my podcast. Cause I'm like, yeah, yeah. well, but I was like, I don't want to ruin someone else's podcast. <laughs> Wouldn't ruin it at all. I love dogs. Sorry, Chip. I love dogs. <laughs> um, when did you find that you had this thirst for more knowledge? Was this uh, in like in dentistry? Was this something that you're always like just super inquisitive and, and curious, or is that something that came on a little bit later? Okay, you know how you talked about how like, hey, the dentistry we do today is way different than the dentistry I was exposed to in dental school. I feel the exact same as you. Um, This is not at all to knock on my dental school, but we were very old school. So I really only practically ever placed alloys. I only ever really did PFMs. It was a lot of removable. And so that kind of, I wasn't necessarily crazy about that, um, that side of dentistry. But then like coming into the Air Force and being exposed to like, kind of this very sexy dentistry of like chairside digital dentistry and like I don't know now I do like all these beautiful cases in Exocad and like IV sedation and all the complexity of these beautiful materials and this wide array of materials and I was like oh my gosh like actually it was after dental school I fell in love with dentistry I was like oh my gosh this is the coolest thing ever like I will spend the rest of my life trying to learn this and I still cannot learn everything and um, I think for that I think it was almost just becoming so filled with gratitude that I was like, I want to devote my life to trying to master this. Were you, were you always a sort of like a naturally curious person? Because I think there's lots of people who, who love what we do, but they just go in and they just practice and they'll, you, you know, they'll, they'll learn the basics and they'll just do that and repeat and learn some more and they'll learn that and repeat. But you're someone who's been really aggressively trying to learn more and more and more. And I just asked because like when I was in dental school, when uh, um, true, uh, we had a stadium seating and for our materials lecture, dental materials lecture, we, Greg, Frank, and I sat in the back and on the top very top row. And I'd sleep through every dental materials lecture. I found them so incredibly boring. And there's something that lit a fire 
with me when I started practicing dentistry that I wasn't understanding really if, if it was working or if, I, if something didn't work, I was, I didn't understand. I became curious much later. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, were you just sort of just always sort of naturally curious or is this something that just at fire got lit under you sort of what happened to me? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's a also kind of a crazy concept to unpack. So I think in some regards, I've kind of always been this way. I think it's just that it's sort of now it's tailored toward dentistry. Um, but I think actually it's funny how there's things about us that we for so many years think is like a shortcoming or a setback. And then we realize like, oh, I can harness this and this can become a gift. And I think I was always kind of um, nerdier perhaps growing up. And I think I was very self-conscious about that. Um, and so I always kind of viewed it as like a setback that um, I really enjoyed like intellectually stimulating conversations and I'd rather read than watch TV and yeah, I, I don't know, all those sorts of things. And it's funny how now in adulthood, maybe that's paying dividends, but that was not easy in like childhood yeah. and adolescence. You know? Yeah, that's not, not often, you're not often the first selected for the, for the, for the kickball team, when you're, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like in high school though, I would be kind of like ashamed of it. So I'd really try to, that was actually, that was a harder thing is I think I realized like, oh, this is not so cool. So I would become someone who I wasn't and I oh. would actually like really pretend to be really dumb because I thought it was like not cool to be smart and um that I mean that had a whole host of consequences um, sure. but I think the role of the story is is like just embrace truly who you are because there's a reason that you're wired that way yeah no doubt about it when you're you're in your AGD and you're you go out and you do a couple of years uh be, be in intermission one of the things I like to ask about and talk about is mentors, like who, mm -hmm. who guided you, who helped you see, you know, further than, yeah. than you knew. And so who, who are some of the people that sort of lit your fire? Can you be, or can you tell me a little bit more? Do you mean like related to the AGD or people that are really? No, just in dentistry. Like, like I can tell you. So my story is I saw Frank Spear present way back in 2000, yeah. uh, 1992, excuse me. And, and it completely changed my life. And I didn't know dentistry could be done like that. Now that I had other influences, I had some wonderful uh, teachers at Michigan, Leo Klausner and Frank Pink and Dennis Turner. There's a whole bunch of them that were Mark Fitzgerald. There was tons of them, the Heist brothers. But really, Frank Spear was the one where I saw like, oh, my God, dentistry can look like like that. That was incredible. Yeah. And that was the first person that sort of turned me on. And then Bob Winter and just so many others from there. But was there was there a couple key people that sort of opened your eyes to the possibilities of dentistry? So it's so funny that you say that because for me, it's also Frank Spear, no oh, joke, because here's why. So like I talked about, it was a very hard transition for me. That was actually like one of the hardest years of my life, the transition from dental school into like the AGD and just realizing just how woefully behind I was. Mm -hmm. um, and Spear Education, um, they do this really cool thing where they had Spear online. And oh, nice. so um, I would nights and weekends do everything I could to get caught up because this is the thing is I feel like in those kind of environments, you can't let on that you don't, you don't know. Um, so you just kind of have to fake it till you make it. And then you go home that night or that weekend and try to binge it just to get caught up. And so it's funny because like, I'm eternally grateful. <laughs> this is so funny. Like there are very few corporations. I'll say I'm eternally grateful to them. You know, it's like right. Trader Joe's USAA. Um, but Spear Education, like, yeah, what Frank Spear has done, the way he's made education palpable and interesting, um, and the platform that, I guess, that has been built from his legacy. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. I mean, just how how many people he and John Coyce and Dawson and so many others, how, how many they've influenced. That's That's interesting, though, that you had a similar, you know, you had the you had the new version where I would see him live speaking, you know, you, you saw yeah. him, you know, on demand. And so that's yeah. the, uh, that's, that's the reality. And, and then like, from there, so that, that sort of lit a light and then who else is sort of, yeah. I, I know that you're, you have a lot of contact with Jeff Rouse and Bill Robbins, right? Because Bill's down there. Um, yeah. And uh, are they, have they been part of sort of your, your pathway also? Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's almost like, um, I think I have to be careful with this because I think I can start to really get, really compare myself. And so that can kind of begin to gnaw away at me. But I would say, I feel like there's probably 
10 people and you're certainly one of them. Um, yeah, like I would say Rouse, I would say like certainly Bill Robbins. I think Bob Marges's ability to make sure. education like really understanding. I think Marcus Vargas, like his skills and what he's able to do with his hands. Um, like I would say a group of people like that. I think Dennis Fassbinder, like what he's done like for research and literature. Um, those are my North Stars you like what you've done just what we were talking about what I think is so impressive is that you have these decades of experience but you are so on top of it and that's what I makes you a very valuable educator and so it's like I have these north stars right but I have to be really careful and realize like I'm in a different position than you all are so it's like yeah maybe I'm not getting always the same opportunities but like it's okay you know because you guys have so many more decades ahead of me like it's okay. And so I think I'll kind of really start to compare myself. And so I think I have to be careful with those, those North stars, you know, like just, yeah. does that make sense? 100%. I, I look back as, as a young dentist and there's just incredible teachers yeah. and uh, incredible dentists and technicians that I would learn from. And we're all on our own journey. We're all on our own path. And it doesn't matter if you've been practicing for a year, you've been practicing for 35 years like me. We're all on our own path and we all learn at different rates and we're going to, and things are going to become very evident to us at different times. Mm -hmm. And I think we just have to accept that we're on our path and we have to treat ourselves in a healthy way to accept that, hey, I, I can, I mean, personally, I can turn turn on Instagram and see dentistry that just blows me away. I mean, it's yes. phenomenal. Right. And I've been doing this for 35 years and I can't do do this, this stuff. It's just so incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, you know, because I'm on my path and I am where I am. And everyone at their path, they have to sort of accept that. And that is what what the key is though is to be engaged and to be encouraged and and not be discouraged by what you're seeing and just understand that we're all on our journey, we're all on our path. We have to learn it and get better and collaborate and just continue continue our path and not worry about what other other paths people have taken because you don't know you, you don't know what advantages what disadvantages you don't know their story and yeah. so you can only live live the story that you have i think so right. that's, that's it, what we do. yeah that's the thing and it's like you'll hear mental health experts and they'll talk about like oh you know you have to be careful with social media and with my personal social media like no not at all i don't think i've ever had an instance where that messed with me but with dental like the dental side of things, man, I have got to be careful. There are times where I just like have to shut it off because it sure. messes with your head. And then there's some stuff on there that I'm not always convinced is actually truly their work. Like so in some instances, I'm like, I think this has been altered a little bit, but it's taken me time to be able to recognize that. And so I think on the earlier days, it would really mess with me and be like, wow, I, I will never be able to do this. And then you realize like, no, like, uh, I don't know. Some of this isn't always real. Yeah, you know, there, there's a reality to that. And that's unfortunately the, the world we live in. But the, the reality is there's there's going to be incredibly gifted people and they can be in your community or somewhere else. Right. And you have to sort of embrace it and and say it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve my patients in the best of my ability and I'm going to do the best I can. And I'm going to try and get better every day. Uh, Jim Hara, our coach at Michigan, always says, uh, get better 1% every day. You get better for 1%, you know, you're going to get there. Now, it doesn't happen every day, but that's that's our goal is get a little bit better every day. Yeah. So, yeah, for anyone out there who's, you know, you know looking at Instagram and just saying, no, you, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, hopefully, it will inspire you. And that's the, I, I, that's what I look at is like, and some days I don't want to be inspired, quite honestly. Some days it's like, I'm not in the mood. And this is not inspiring to me today. Today, I don't want to look at this because it's just so, so dang beautiful. But there's other days where it's like, yeah, this is, this is really interesting. And I'll learn and I'll say, hey, you know what? I, this, this is a concept that I, I can take from. So I think mm -hmm. it comes in all sorts of packages, but we have to be healthy to ourselves mm -hmm. as we get healthy for our patients. True. When you look back now, and so you've been you've been out of school for about a decade or so, right? Five. I've been out for five years. Oh, from you got out of, school, out of Louisville was five years ago. I was thinking it was yes. longer than that. Okay. So when you finish, so you're going to finish with your your program this mm -hmm. year, right? Right. And then you're going to be teaching. They they offered you a position. Will Which that be a full? Is that will be a full time position? Yeah, that's going to be legit. So it's funny because I told myself like. 
when I graduate dental school, heck no, like I, you're never going to catch me like in an education like position that's for chumps, you know, uh, which of course isn't true. Um, but uh, it's wild because I think with kind of what I've been up to just starting with like the podcast and then having opportunities to present and then write and all that I realized like oh actually this is my favorite aspect of dentistry and so I'm very grateful I will get to go teach in one of the Air Force's one-year AGDs I'll be at uh, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia Beach oh, awesome yeah congratulations that's so cool I'm excited come visit come visit we will Love be to. by the beach that's awesome so tell me about your podcast. So you started your podcast, uh, I think if I remember right, like right when COVID was uh, just getting into gear, right? Just uh, early 20, 20, 2020, um, right? It's wild because during COVID, a ton of people started podcasts. But interestingly, I started probably three months before like COVID kicked off, which was such a gift because yeah. I was like ready to go, you know, so we had the whole framework in place. What uh, what inspired you to do a podcast? So this is funny because it's it's funny. I've I feel like I'm sharing so much of my journey, which I share with so few people. But here we are. So remember how I told you that the struggle, like from sleep apnea, the struggle from dental school into the real world was a very painful transition for me. And so, um, in that one year where I was really doing everything I could to somewhat conceivably get caught up to speed, um basically because of the Air Force, my husband and I, like my husband was in San Antonio, um, where I am now, but I was at Barksdale Air Force Base. In Louisiana. And he's in the Air Force as well, correct? Yeah, he's actually a civilian, oh, he uh, but, okay. but he's in a residency program that he's about to graduate. And so he had to be in San Antonio and I had to be at Barksdale Air Force Base or seven hours apart. So we would drive every weekend. We take turns. He was going to drive to visit each other right so mm -hmm. you're spending a lot of time listening to audiobooks and podcasts and I was like man I really wish there was a podcast that could help me to like get caught up to the speed um or stay on the cutting edge of evidence-based dentistry like just something to help me and there are definitely some like really good podcasts out there but I think I was like I need something with like my niche you know because some of it was stuff I couldn't relate to like practice management or right. some of it was kind of so far advanced that I was like hey um I'm, I'm lost in the weeds right now so that was kind of like literally that was the impetus for the podcast so I basically six months after I graduated I'm like we're gonna do this that's awesome. I mean, the the podcasts I think classically available are either business related, yeah. or sort of like uh, like I love the the old dental hacks and the Ellen Mead stuff, which yeah. is just clinically based. But there's no there's no science behind it, right? It's just clinicians talking about what they're doing, which is great. Yeah. But there there really was a void for having educators, people who are doing the research, people who are doing all the science behind it to talk about the the legit stuff that's going on. And I think that obviously yours has really filled the void because it's become super, super popular. So I think like number one podcast in dentistry or something like that. You know, I think, I think, uh, me and, um, dental hacks, uh, very dental podcast. I think we're kind yeah. of competitors, but it's really beautiful because Alan Mead is like the salt of the earth. Oh my Truth. gosh. Like he is just phenomenal. He's helped me with figuring out podcast equipment. We're going to get to go live podcast at Spear together this year. Oh, nice. Um, so it is like a real treat to even say that I'm kind of on Alan's playing field because, mm -hmm. I mean, he is incredible. And he is really the king of dental podcasting. And I it's, agree. It's so cool to see him holding it down after all these years. Yeah, he's awesome. He's got the best voice in dentistry. I mean, he's he's made for radio and uh I, I tell me as a face for for podcasts. Uh, but he's uh his his stuff is awesome, but yours is just different. It gives it more more science behind it, which I think is really interesting. And I can see where it's interesting that you saw that void. And I, I didn't really realize that, but uh, as soon as I started listening to your stuff, it's like, well, wow, you're really onto something. And I think you've done such a great job. Thank you. That's cool. Well, what what have you learned from doing the podcast? Like what uh, when you started doing it, what mm -hmm. uh, what were you expecting, and what did you what did you find? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, um, I found a lot of things. I think I like it built a lot of confidence for me because I don't know. I'm sure you can relate to this, but I'm telling you, Dennis. Like, listen, the first hundred episodes I did, I had like a pit in my stomach. I was absolutely dreading it. I because it was like some of these guests are like very high profile and it was very yeah. nerve wracking 
um, which I'm sure you can relate to right now, how it's really hard to be the host and be on the other side of things. And you always have to, you want to be attentive, but you want to be thinking about the next question. Um, there's so many things running through your mind and it was really stressful, right? And the first episodes were not good. Like I deleted some of them and that's okay. <laughs> but the reason it gave me confidence is because it made me realize that I'm like, I, I like really beat myself up really bad if I don't get something the first time but mm. with the podcast that was the first time in my life I think I gave myself grace um to say like it's okay if it's not very good right now but it's gonna get better um and that was like a life-changing paradigm where I realized now when I start something I'm doing something for the first time and it's not good I give myself a lot more grace and say of course it's not good it's because you're doing this for the first time but it's gonna get better you know Fantastic. so that like it was it was some therapy I mean it took like I don't know 167 episodes now but the juice is worth the squeeze that's fantastic advice just in life right and especially in dentistry I remember I had a we were doing our first uh, provisionals uh, in in our preclinic so on a type of that and I asked the instructor and I don't remember who it was no one that was memorable to me certainly. And I asked him, you know, if, if I'm going to be a little short or if I'm going to be a little, little long on the provisional, you know, which way should I go? Mm -hmm. And he said, don't, don't be, don't be too long. Don't be too short. Just don't. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, but I'm human, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I didn't respond of course, cause I just like, we're expected to be perfect. At least uh, in my training, when I was at Michigan, we were expected to be perfect. We'd have to have perfect margins, right? Everything had to be perfect. And we're being graded in dental school as if we're dentists, right? We're doing, yeah. we're doing the first time we we're ever doing a procedure in a human mouth yeah. and we're expected to have expertise. It's a challenge. And I think this is a challenge when we go into practice and certainly, you know, as I mean, I've developed a certain amount of expertise because I've done it for so dang long and I've worked really hard at it. But, you know, there are times when it isn't so good. And there are times when, you know, a patient can't open that, you know, I can't get a rubber dam on because they're hacking or they, you know, they're yeah. pulling it off. I just had someone <laughs> trying to pull off the rubber dam the other day. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Clean that yeah. out. You know, and so we, we work on the human. And I think we have to give ourselves a little grace because it, you know, when it goes well, it's great. But there are times when it's way, way more challenging. So I think that's really great advice, Melissa, is, you know, give ourselves a little, little grace on this stuff, because what we do in dentistry is hard. Yeah. And anyone tells you otherwise, I don't get it, because I think what we do is really, I mean, it's wonderful. And we're, I think we're lucky to be able to do it. But I think it's super, super challenging, generally. Yeah. Working in the mouth, I think is hard. Yes. So that's someone who's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. I don't want to keep you much longer, but I do want to, I want to follow up with a couple, a couple things. So as a young dentist, as a, as a young female dentist, when you sort of look out in the, in the dental place, and as you start to get along, uh, what's, uh, where do you see women in dentistry? Where do you, where do you see their, do you see them taking a stronger role in leadership in organized, organized dentistry? Do you see them just, uh, I mean, we have 50% of our classes now are, are, are women and stuff. What are you, what are you seeing? You know, I don't exactly know. I think that, um, I really hope to see more women kind of, um, in these leadership roles. I feel like time will certainly, I, I think kind of with the trajectory that we're going on, I think we'll certainly see this. Um, but you know, I talked about the whole idea of he for she, but I also think that like, I think we as women, we have to be courageous um, and kind of also see some opportunities. Um, so, and I, I also think be very supportive of one another. I think um, right now there aren't a lot of females in leadership positions. And I think what I'm seeing are there are definitely some women privately tearing them down. And sometimes I feel like mm. there's jealousy. There's like, I think to an extent, some of it's contributed to jealousy. And so um I, I think we need to be supportive of one another. And I also think that we need to be courageous. And I also think that anytime someone is swimming upstream, it's really uncomfortable. And you're going to be asking yourself if you're doing the right thing. Um, but but certainly that's really how change happens is being uncomfortable. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, listen, I think this has been just an awesome opportunity to hang out. And this is so I started this year cast in the pandemic. Uh, because I miss my friends. 
Yeah. And so for me, it was easy doing the podcast because my first one was with Jim McKee, who's a good, good buddy of mine and said, Hey, let's chat. And then I got Jeff on the, on the podcast and we just chatted. And this is sort of just sort of how it's gone. It's uh, just for me, it's an opportunity to connect. And when I was a young dentist and I would see these just remarkable dentists, you know, the Coys, the Spears, the Dawson's and all these just wonderfully, wonderfully skilled clinicians and teachers and leaders. I thought they were different from us. And as I've grown up and I've gotten to know uh, the the true leaders and these these educators, they're they're so much like us. They're they're us, right? right? And so part of the, my goal with this is to help young dentists out there understand that we're all the same, right? We all had our struggles, right? And I think people will be refreshed to hear that you know you struggled through school. That as you're killing it in your podcast and you're showing this beautiful work in your Instagram. That you know what you you weren't born with a silver dental drill in your hand and a, mm. you know you know you you worked for this and you've yeah. you've had to overcome and I think that's really inspiring for people and that's that's the stories that I like to share and hear when we do our our sharecast so thank you so much for joining us and sharing all your all your awesome stuff thank you so much for having me and I'm super excited for what you're building with Dot and everything that you've already accomplished so this is a real honor thank you Dennis you're welcome hey uh, share again your your podcast so those know and your Instagram thank you uh, so it's the Dental Digest podcast it can be found anywhere you get your podcasts um, Apple's, Apple Podcasts Spotify all those platforms um, I have my personal professional Instagram which is uh, Dr. Melissa Cyber and then I also created one for the podcast which is Dental Digest podcast so thank you and then I think you're going to be doing a webinar for Cosmodent soon I think I saw that coming up when is that I am that's not until May I'm doing one for the ACD tomorrow though Oh, fantastic. Which is yeah, funny. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm basically, it's funny because after our conversation with the presentation for you guys last week, that like really got me thinking about something. So I definitely like probably changed like a solid fifth of the presentation. I, like I always do that, I guess. That's uh, I saw Frank Spear. This is back with the old days when we had slides and carousels and in the, uh, in the break of a presentation, Frank was rearranging his slides and his carousels. Yeah. And it, it always struck with me that, you know what, a presentation should be a living, uh, living being. It should not be something that is just um, stagnant and static. It's got to be dynamic. And dynamic. so I'm always changing my presentations. And that's always right up to the moment of presentation. I'm I'm thinking, you know what, this would be clear if I just added a little bit of this. So good for you. I think that makes it for, for better for your audience. So awesome. You. And good luck tomorrow. You'll do great. Thanks, Dennis. You are awesome. Thank you. All right, Dental Online Trainers, thanks for hanging out with us while we got to spend a little time with my good friend, Melissa. Uh, check out her podcast and check out her Instagram as she talked about. And we look forward to seeing you at future Dental Online Training events, uh, either through our evening webinars or Wine and Unwind, as Melissa joined us just recently, uh, through our study clubs on Fridays, and of course, through our live virtual hands-on courses that we teach throughout the year. So until next time, yours for better dentistry. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartley. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for listening or viewing our ShareCast today. If you enjoy this and you want to get more information from dental online training, then check us out at dothandson.com. That's one word, dothandson.com. Now, as a reminder, DOT has so many other great opportunities for your learning. We have our Wine and Unwind monthly webinars where we engage real time with our viewers as we bring in leaders throughout the dental industry to bring you up to date information and answer your questions. We have our monthly coffee and donut study club sessions where our participants bring in cases and we treat and plan these cases together to help you bring great treatment to your patients. We have our live virtual workshops where our dental online trainers perform the same techniques from their kits as I'm doing from the comfort of their own home or office. We have our blogs and we have endless selection of our hands-on pre-recorded technique courses to help you improve the clinical dentistry that you can provide for your patients. That's right. With our on-demand courses, you do these hands-on exercises when the time is right for you. So check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at Dental Online Training. And hey, be sure to share this with your friends and colleagues who you think might benefit from this ShareCast 
and everything that DOT has to offer. And now, how about one of those coveted five-star ratings? Please go to your site and help us by getting the word out to others. And we'd welcome one of those wonderful five-star ratings. This episode was created with special help from Claire O'Neill. It was edited by Ashley Dixon Ellison and with original music by Chris Peterson. Again, thank you for listening. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartley, yours for better dentistry.